Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Marsha Biggs. I'm a freelance journalist and special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Um, I'll be presiding over today's discussion. We are joined by all of you in person um, in New York and over 150 attending virtually on Zoom. So I'd love to see that that many people are here to talk about Haiti. Um, and I want to, um, to welcome my panelists. I have here Brian Nichols, the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. Thank you for being here. Gary Pierre Pierre, the founder and publisher of the Haitian Times. Thank you. And Monique Kleska, the, um, the member of the Commission for the Search for a Haitian Solution to the Crisis and a signatory of the Montana Accord. <coughs> um, so let's get into it. Uh, let's, can you see my time? See my time? Sort of. Um, Port-au-Prince has been pl plagued by gang violence for the last several years, um, but in the last six weeks, violence has become so untenable that Prime Minister Ariel Henry had to agree to resign. Uh, he'd been functioning as the president since the assassination of uh, President Jovenel Moïse in July of 2021 and had largely been seen, seen as an illegitimate successor. Um, now a seven-member presidential council has been created to appoint a new leader, but it took weeks to actually come to a consensus on the formation of that committee. And in the meantime, over 50,000 people have fled their homes, a fractured but heavily armed coalition of gangs has taken the streets, killing and raping, burning down hospitals, pharmacies, shutting the airport, taking over the port. A lack of food and essential supplies have led an estimated 1.6 million people to be on the brink of famine. A multinational security support mission led by Kenyan forces has yet to deploy due to the power vacuum. So Gary, let me start with you. How did we get here? Well, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. How did we get here? Well, I probably could start by uh, in 1804, after Haiti got its independence, but we won't. We only have a half an hour before we do Q&A. I do appreciate the history, though. Well, we, we can go back to uh, right after the earthquake, where uh, there was a lot of goodwill from the international community. People wanted Haiti to work, and the UN uh, forces were there. And a couple years later, the UN left. And we started to see a black backsliding of democracy, where it seems that the leaders were not too interested in this dem democracy thing. And uh, the, the politicians and uh, many of the um, business leaders started using these gangs to settle scores in the streets. They worked for, for, for politicians and, and um, business leaders. By 2018, this is a critical moment. Uh, they lost control of the gangs. The gangs realized that they had the upper hands. They were well armed, so they no longer needed to do the bidding of the elite. And so chaos began. Uh, the country was locked down in a very comical way, if you will. There's nothing funny about it. But the Haitian government had been under pressure from the international com community, mainly the IMF and the World Bank to stop subsidizing fuel. And it was a very contentious issue. And the government tried to, to, to pass that decree during the World Cup when Brazil was playing Belgium in the quarterfinal. They assumed that Brazil was going to win, that Haitians who are madly in love with Brazilian soccer would take to the streets to celebrate. As fate would have it, Brazil lost. People did take to the streets not to celebrate, but to protest violently against the, the, the ending the subsidies where the price of gas was going to be double. And it just, DS just went down from, from there. Where 2021, Jovenel Moïse was assassinated, and he was deeply unpopular because less than 10% of the uh, voting population did actually vote. So he had no mandate, he had no popular support. He had no support of the civil society, uh, no one. So he was just there flailing. Ultimately, he got assassinated, and we are seeing the effect of that vacuum currently, where gangs, I mean, we use the term gangs, we talk about that all the time, but they're not street gangs. They are hardened criminals with heavily armed, better armed than the police, and they've been running the, the, the country, or 
actually not wanting it. And here we are. Uh, people have to be evacuated out of Haiti. Uh, my co-panelist here, Monique Leska, was telling me how she had to be evacuated by the UN. And so it's a really difficult situation right now. So let me turn to you, uh, Monique. I want to speak to the two Haitians first, and then I'll get to you. But um, you are a signatory and spokesperson for the Montana Accord, which proposed a Haitian-led solution to forming a transitional government after the murder of Jovenel Moise in 2021. It was rejected by the US. Now, finally, we've reached this crisis, and you all have gotten what you've asked for, um, albeit two and a half years later. But this council has been mired in conflict, and it's taken weeks just to form a committee, which was just formed um, yesterday. Um, can a consensus on a new president, prime minister, government be reached in time? And is the presidential council not made up of some of the same players that got Haiti into this mess in the first place? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for being here. Uh, I, will, I would respond by saying, first of all, we have not gotten what we wanted. What we wanted was systematic change, governance change. And I think uh, Gary Pierre Pierre has been extremely nice by not saying that we have been run by a mafia state. And we must say it. It has been a mafia state that has been running Haiti since 2011. So he has been very gentle with, a, with his description. And when you are run by a mafia state, this is what happens. Eventually, the mafia takes over the streets, and the mafia took over the president's bedroom and killed him. And then the mafia now has taken over the street. Now, having said this, since the, our accord, we started working on it in March 2021. Jovenel Moïse died on the right. evening of the 6th to 7th of July. So we had been working on this for about six months by the time that Jovenel Moïse died. <laughs> now, the, our court stipulated a two-year transition. It stipulated a national conference so that Haitians could be talking to each other so we could at least say what it is that was our vision for Haiti. Because one of the things that Gary Pierre did not mention is that when there were the riots in July 2018, which is kind of the beginning of this crisis with the Brazil a game, and a, I'm pleased that he remembers who Brazil was playing, but <laughs> one of the things that was on the agenda in terms of the riots, what they were asking for was schools, they were asking for health care, they were asking for professional training. So there was a social justice agenda. And parts, elements of this also were part of our accord. And I think it's important to signal this. Two-thirds of Haiti's population is under 24 years old. So unless you deal with those issues of social justice, you will not resolve problems of the gang's issue, because somewhere along the line, if you're coming with a machine gun and, you know, you don't have anything to balance it, they're going to go for the machine gun. And mm -hmm. I've seen it, for example, in Niger, where I was for four years. So I think it's important to know this. There was a social justice demand by youth, which continued anti-corruption, <laughs> anti-impunity. Okay, fast track now to now. The accord that is there, and I must say I'm pleased about reading it, about two-thirds or more of it really is almost copy-pasted from the Montana Accord, and a lot of work has gone in to negotiate this. But bottom line, why did we have to wait two and a half years? Why did it took so many dead people? 5,000 or more girls and women were raped last year alone, reported. Did we need to go there? So we have lost a lot of time. And I dare say that this is a really massive foreign policy failure of the United States. Because whether we like it or not, 
the United States really holds the strings for Haiti's leaders. And we must admit that. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with Mr. Nichols and looking forward to what will be said. So now, will this work? I don't know. I really don't know. I'm, I'm tempted to say, you know, somewhere along the line, my head says it's not going to work. Because a lot of these people are the ones who put us there. A lot of these people are people who finance the gangs. A lot of them. So how are you going to, you know, in order to make peace to move forward, we had to have an accord. Because last time, after Duvalier left, everybody said, well, the, the people who were with Duvalier are not in it. It didn't work. So somewhere along the line, in order, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your adversaries. So we need this. Will it work? I don't know. Why is it taking so long? I don't know either, because it's taking a long time to get things going. But then, if you're speaking with your adversary, you're going to have to convince him to do A, to do B, to do C. We're trying to do this, but it's too slow. People are dying every day. Women are being raped every day. So I don't know how we can fast track, but I am, in a way, hopeful. But realistically, I'm saying, is this really going to work? I don't know. Ask me later. Oh, I will. <laughs> um, so I'll get to, to trying to maintain the security in the meantime uh, in a moment. But first, I want to get to you, uh, Assistant Secretary. Um, you said that the U.S. wants a new approach to Haiti, uh, but it had a direct hand in politics, essentially picking leaders for, for decades. Last month, the U.S. finally called for Henri's resignation. <coughs> why, why wait for so long to, why recognize him for so long with seemingly no conditions on elections and transparency amidst tension and violence every day? And, and, and what do you see the U.S.'s role going forward? Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's a pleasure to be with such distinguished colleagues here on the panel. Uh, the United States approach, um, you know, from the day that I came in uh, to work on Haiti issues, has been very much focused on promoting a Haitian-led solution to the problem, uh, precisely because the United States and others in the international community had played such a determinative role in Haiti's politics over generations um, to ill effect I would argue, it was essential that we give Haitians the space to make their own decisions and to move forward in a way to create um, a political space for progress and elections. Uh, we have been deeply engaged in supporting that process. Uh, my first overseas trip as Assistant Secretary was to Haiti immediately after the intensive meetings in New York in uh, 2021 on the margins of the UN General Assembly. Uh, we have had Secretary Blinken uh, just hosted a donors conference for the multinational security support mission uh, on the margins of the G20 in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he, he's met with uh, uh, Prime Minister Henri uh, in Port of Spain uh, to uh, encourage progress last summer. Uh, so uh, we've had uh, our UN permanent representative, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and I uh, met with CARICOM leaders in Guyana uh, in March to talk about the way forward on Haiti. And we have been uh, doing this in a way, one, to support Haitians to come to a decision about the way forward. And I'm very glad that many elements of the uh, Montana Accord are incorporated uh, into the Transitional Presidential Council uh, process. But um, what we're effectively uh, looking at is the entire breadth of the Haitian political spectrum trying to agree on something. That's not easy. You can't, you know, there's no country where it's easy to get everybody from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum to come to agreement. And all the sectors have been in intense negotiations for months and months and months trying to do that. The conversations really intensified under uh, CARICOM, the regional organizations 
AGs uh, starting uh, at the beginning of March. And then on March 11th, Secretary Blinken traveled uh, to Kingston to uh, meet with uh, CARICOM heads and, and try and push uh, the process por forward, including uh, some 40 Haitian stakeholders at that time. Uh, I would note that while we've been supporting a political accord uh, in Haiti, we're also continuing to be the largest donor to Haiti. We provide about $360 million a year in assistance to Haiti, focused on uh, humanitarian support, economic support, and security support. Um, we have a long-term strategy uh, for Haiti under the Global Fragility Act um, that has a 10-year plan to support Haiti's uh, increased stability and autonomy. Uh, the, there's mention of the former UN mission there, MINUSTA. Um, when MINUSTA was withdrawn uh, after more than a decade in Haiti, uh, you lost the key security underpinning that the country needed uh, to be able to maintain its security. If you look at the population of Haiti, 11 million people, uh, there are about now less than 8,000 police in Haiti. Compare that to the city of New York, where there's 45,000 police. So there's, there's just not enough security uh, to deal with normal policing issues. And then the use of gangs by uh, corrupt elites, uh, as well as desperate people on the streets, um, has exacerbated the security challenges uh, that the country faces. Uh, I am confident that this political accord will come together, and maybe as soon as today or tomorrow. Uh, I am confident that the multinational security support mission will deploy to Haiti and give the Haitian National Police they su the support that they need uh, to be able to provide security in the country. And I would note that under extremely difficult circumstances, the Haitian National Police have been defending key infrastructure and fighting off gangs that do often outnumber them and have uh, superior equipment uh, in some cases. So. Um, this is a pivotal moment, but I continue to believe uh, that we're moving in the right direction and Haiti will have a better future as it moves towards elections and a restoration of democratic government. Not to belabor the point though, but why wait so long? Why wait two and a half years? Because not because we're continuing to recognize Henri is in a sense taking a side and not pulling back completely and allowing the Haitians to come to a Haitian-led solution. Um, when we have been so involved in their politics for but so long. But how is it a Haitian-led solution if we just go in and say, you're not coming to an agreement fast enough, we're just going to pick somebody else to run Haiti? That's the opposite of a Haitian-led solution. But here we are today, we've reached a crisis, and now we, now we no longer recognize Henri. That's my question. Why, why the, wait so long to make that choice? The reality of the situation in Haiti, the facts on the ground were such that uh, it was untenable for him to govern. He was prevented from returning to the country. Uh, the regional organization, uh, CARICOM, um, also felt that it was essential that there be um, a change in Haiti. Uh, we have tried to support first Haitian-led solution and the relevant regional organization in trying to find a way forward rather than having the United States uh, again impose a decision on who runs Haiti. Let's then now move on to the security situation because as Monique mentioned, this is take, gonna take a long time and in the meantime, people are dying, people are fleeing their homes, people are, are going hungry. Um, this multinational security support mission, um, which is meant to be led by Kenyan police officers, has also been uh, mired in conflict. The, the deployment has been mired in conflict, both on the Kenyan political side now because of the power vacuum and also because of the funding. Um, it's set to deploy once pledges are raised and a new leader's been appointed. Can it actually suppress the gangs? I'll ask you first, Gary. Does it, does it have a chance? Well, yeah, if it has the proper uh, ammunition support, the most important element is the uh, intelligence uh, data that the police, whatever forces, even the Haitian National Police, I'm glad Brian uh, mention them because they have been doing a, a really great job all things considered and they have the capacity but they just don't have the support and I want I would like I don't want I can't want it I would like for the police to be the hero in this story because 
I think you lay the groundwork for to building a better society. If if people uh, respect the police and you can restore the rule of law, then Haiti has a chance. Uh, anything shorter than that, you back to Minusta being the savior. And as Brian said, once they leave, the the gangs just wait them out. They know that they cannot remain permanent. But the Haitian police, they are permanent. And if, if, if they're strong enough uh, and they have the proper support, this is something my sources at NYPD told me. It can be done. A, a specialized force can take care of these gangs because they've never had, nobody has ever shot back with heavy uh, 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 military or even back at them because they've, they've just been shooting at people, defenseless people, and the police just trying to maintain some kind of order as much as they can. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens when they face real fi firepower because a lot of the soldiers are just street thugs. They, they're not military uh, trained. They're not trained militarily or anything. They're just shooting at people or defenseless. And so therefore, yes, they will. But I must say that Honestly, that's the least, that's the easiest part to solve. And as Monique is talking about, Haiti's social fabric has to be stitched back together. It's one of the most, if not the most, uh, uh, unequal society where the wealth, you know, is in the hands of 10 families or less. And under that system, she referred to as a mafia state. Well, you have to really eradicate the mafia. And for too long, U.S. Uh, diplomats and other officials deal, dealt with these people in a way where they felt that they had Washington's backing in whatever crime they were committing and also not paying their taxes. Uh, uh, and, and, and so the state doesn't have any money to, to provide schools and all the uh, services that any government provides to its citizens. And so it's a complete breakdown right now. So the problem to me is the security is a short-term problem that can be dealt with professionally. But stitching back Haitian society, that's going to be the real challenge. And Monique, pivoting off of what he just said about the elites, how do you eradicate the mafia state when the, ma or the mafia when the mafia is at the table? Well, with great difficulty. Uh, yeah, with great difficulty. Now, I think, you know, let, let me frame it. The, it's all about power and money. And even now, you know, some of the news is telling us that a, such a economic uh, powerhouse gave one of the members an armored car, uh, we're, we're being told things like this. Even now, they're trying to influence some of these people. So we, we got to know this. But bottom line, I think if we manage to move forward, what we must realize is that the change cannot be cosmetic, because that's what it was with Minusta. It cannot be a cosmetic change. It has to be a profound change. And the population knows this. And I think it's important, even though, you know, a lot of people perhaps are not educated, you know, in schools, but people are not dumb. They know this. They know what's going on. And I think it is important for us to go into more popular education, more democratic kind of education, civic education, because the big problem is what? The big problem is the people who came in believe that government is there for them to get rich and stay in power, rather than government is there to service the population. Government is there to provide you with health care, to provide you with education, to provide you with security. So that mind change, that mindset change, that paradigm change also must come with education. And when people were in the streets protesting, a lot of what I heard, because I was also in the streets protesting, was, wait a minute, they had all this money and they stole it? You mean they could have provided schools? 
You mean they could have provided health care? They stole all that money because there was close to $4 billion that was stolen from the uh, Venezuela loan. And all of this could have given education, could have given health care, job training, etc. So the people are beginning to ask that their leaders provide services. So when they went to the street in July 18th, I actually heard one protester say, the president must know Haiti is not only for him, it's for us also. So that is a clear demand that we must change. And if we don't listen to that, we're going to go back to the same thing. And if I may just say something, a couple of things, one of the things that Mr. Nichols has said is, what is the Haitian solution? We presented a Haitian solution that had close to a thousand signatories. You may have issues with it. I don't have a problem with that. But when we presented, the United States said, well, you must put some ketchup in it. OK, you must put coleslaw in it to make it a Haitian solution. OK, put some mustard in it to make it a Haitian solution. Meaning Please. everything we presented, it was you must have something else in it. OK, you must have an agreement with this. You must have an agreement with this. You must sit with this guy. You must sit with this woman. And it was no longer our Haitian solution. It was a Haitian solution that was being changed in the kitchen of the State Department. I'm sorry, I have to say this. I have to say it. The second thing I want to say is, to me, the Kenyans could stay in Kenya. They have their own issues. They have massive human rights issues. I don't see why the United States would be pledging $600 million to bring 1,000 Kenyans to Haiti. If I had that, build some schools, train some more Haitians, maybe some police from elsewhere in Latin America, maybe from the States. There are a lot of Haitian-born, Haitian-American. Find another way. But please, keep the Kenyans in Kenya. Let them do what they must do at home. Do not bring them to Haiti. They'll be going back in body bags. They will. They do not do this to us. We do not want this. However, we need help. We need a lot of help. But where we can get the help, it's not way across East Africa. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Go? Um, All right. No, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, the United States has supported a broad, inclusive dialogue process. Uh, we have not said, add ketchup to the coleslaw. Uh, what we've said is, be inclusive. Talk to others. And the United States was not going to pick the winner of this dialogue process. That has been... Uh, our view. We've wanted to uh, support all Haitians in reaching uh, an agreement. We have um, committed $300 million, uh, $200, $200 million from the Department of Defense, $100 million from the State Department to support the deployment of a UN Security Council authorized multinational security support mission. And in the resolution creating it, there are strict requirements uh, to respect human rights and the rule of law, to provide uh, a, an ombudsman to address uh, concerns and, and requests for redress from the general population, uh, measures to ensure that the forces prevent sexual and gender-based violence, uh, to ensure that popular, uh, proper sanitation measures are taken and health measures are taken to ensure that uh, there's uh, no uh, spreading of disease among the population. Kenya is one of the world's leading contributors uh, to UN peacekeeping operations. Um, and in addition to Kenya, uh, a number of other countries will participate, including from this hemisphere, particularly 
meriting of uh, our thanks and recognition, uh, Jamaica and the Bahamas from the CARICOM region, but also others from this region will participate. The, uh, uh, there have been polls conducted in Haiti showing that at least 70% of the population wants an international mission to help provide security in Haiti. Uh, it is clear that the current situation uh, is untenable. Uh, Gary talked about, uh, the, and you talked about, the horrible violence that Haitians are suffering every single day uh, without international support. Um, that's going to continue, and Haitians are going to suffer. The number one impediment, according to UN agencies, uh, as well as civil society organizations, in delivering humanitarian assistance, like opening clinics uh, provide, to provide health care, uh, schools reopening, uh, is the presence of gangs. Uh, at the beginning of this year and last, schools that refused to pay um, protection money to gangs um, received uh, threatening letters and were attacked, and gangs went in there to shake them down. Uh, so if we want kids to be able to school, uh, go to school, if we want uh, people to receive health care, uh, if we want the economy to function, if we want investment to take place, and by the way, the United States uh, continues to uh, support the hope and help legislation uh, to provide trade preferences to Haiti. Um, we continue to work with uh, partners to support the um, uh, the uh, investment parks that uh, exist in Haiti. Uh, those are all things that we need to do, uh, but this has to be an effort across many, many different lines of effort. There's not one single thing that is going to solve Haiti's problems. We have to work on them all, and we have to do so intensively. Um, there is no greater humanitarian crisis in the world today than what's going on in Haiti. Um, we have to address this. It is vital for the Haitian people, it's vital for our region, and it's vital for the global community, uh, and we're going to work tirelessly uh, to realize the, um, the promise of change uh, for the better in Haiti. We Just two minutes. 30 seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to open it no, to the I, audience. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to say, we had a meeting on January 10th, 2022, two years ago, Mr. Nichols, where you said, we don't pick losers and winners. And I remember I was the one who said, well, in this time, you have picked a loser. And then two years later, then the loser, you dropped him like a hot potato because he... Not because he had killed too many, not because of the failure, but because the gangs then prevented him from going back home. So I, I think if we are going forward, and particularly we are here in the Council of Foreign Relations, we have to, or we have to think about that policy. Was it bad? What can we learn from it? Can we admit that there was a failure? And I think it's important, to me anyway, from the background that I come from, you have to analyze these things and then say, it was a failure, we must do better, et cetera. So we know we need change. And you know, I'm Haitian, I am fighting for change. So I know the humanitarian situation, I know all of that. And I know we can move forward. I just don't want it to be, to, for people to believe the 1,000 Kenyans are coming to save us 11 million and a half Haitians. I'm sorry. No. Can I uh, interject a little bit? Because I think uh, <coughs> the Montana Accord, uh, the group, was not the most flexible. They, uh, they would only talk to Ariel Henry if he resigned. And so no, no, no. In uh, August 2023, uh, okay. we said he had to resign. We talked to him from 21 to August 2023. For two years, we talked to him. Okay. But they were not very fruitful talks. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. Uh, at this moment, I want to open it up to um, members, both in person and on Zoom, to present their questions. Um, and a reminder that this is on the record. Uh, we'll start with a question here in New York, right there. Hi, Renata Segura from Crisis Group. 
Hi, Mary. Um, I have two brief questions. For Mr. Nichols, why has it been so difficult for the US to stop the smuggling of weapons from Florida to Haiti, which yes. we know it's an essential part of the problem? And to Monique, um, uh, not, I'm not talking about having Guy Philippe in the presidential council or anything of that, but it seems to crisis group that having a DDR, um, we need to demobilize some of these gangs. Even if the Kenyans come and they're incredible, we can't hope that they kill everybody, considering also so many of these gang members are children, minors, right? How can we start thinking about processes of demobilization for the gangs that are willing to do so at this point. Do you think that is something that Haiti is ready to start the conversation on? I'll let you start with the weapons trafficking. So uh, just on April 5th, there was a major seizure of weapons uh, headed for Haiti. Uh, the challenge uh, that we face is that uh, firearms are widely available in the United States. Um, in response to that, um, the United States passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which specifically criminalizes the, tra the straw purchasing and trafficking of arms overseas that are used in crime. Uh, last year, the Department of Justice, under the President's direction, created a special prosecutor uh, for uh, gun crimes and smuggling in the Caribbean. Uh, we have two task forces, one based in Miami and one based in Port of Spain, Trinidad, that work with Caribbean countries, including Haiti, uh, to help them uh, trace and interdict the weapons that are smuggled into their countries. Uh, and uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, and other U.S. law enforcement agencies focus intensively on tracking down the networks that are purchasing guns and illegally smuggling them overseas to be used in crime. Um, this is a very serious problem. Uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris have met with Caribbean leaders and talked specifically about the urgency of addressing this issue. Um, at the Summit of the, of the Americas in Los Angeles, there was an intensive conversation about that when <coughs> Vice President Harris went to the Bahamas uh, for the 50th anniversary of CARICOM meeting. We also discussed it. We've discussed it um, uh, in numerous meetings uh, during the entirety of my time uh, in this position, and we are committed to doing all we can and leveraging all the tools that we have, including things like E-Trace, which allows people to trace the serial numbers on weapons that they find uh, uh, through a U.S. database and find out where they were purchased. Uh, all of those measures uh, are ongoing, and um, while they are having an effect, as I said, there was an important seizure uh, just on April 5th, but uh, as much as we've done, we have to continue those efforts and to do more. In terms of a demobilization that you talked about, uh, Renata, I think there are some models in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in terms of demobilization of uh, children who were involved in a fighting, in heavy fighting. And these are models that we started to look at, and these are uh, pretty good models in terms of what has been done. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with social identity uh, types of things, because they, they now identify with the guns, with the, with the power, with you know, burning things, et cetera. And a lot of the work that has to be done involves changing that kind of social identity so that the social identity becomes something uh, more progressive, more about school, more about jobs, more about these kinds of things. So there are some models. Few in Wanda. I haven't looked yet in terms of Latin America. Perhaps there are some things there. But they, there are some models. And to me, the, the Liberia and the Sierra Leone ones are the ones that seem to be the best. And a lot of them, UNICEF has been involved in that. And there is quite a lot of research that can be found on that. Well, now I'm being told to take a question from one of our participants on Zoom. We'll take our next question from Beatrice Rangel. Hi. Um, Good afternoon. 
I my heart is really torn to see what is going on in Haiti because in my past I did work for the development of rule of law and cooperation with that country that is very close to all of us in Venezuela because of the special ties between Miranda and, and, and President. But let me tell you something. What I see is a comedy of errors when it comes to Haiti. And it's not only the United States, it's the whole hemisphere um, in that comedy of error. Uh, I think, and this is my question to Secretary Nichols, why is it that the United States doesn't understand that nation building is not an option in most of the global South and that we have to give the people, what you call popular will, a chance. And that's how, how we need to work with the people, not with the elites, because the elites do not reflect what the people want. And second, why don't we learn from history? Uh, we already had in the hemisphere a, international organized crime setting bases in the Caribbean. Those were the pirates that were armed and sent to take part in the trade between the Americas and Europe by the, the European powers that were excluded from the, the land, uh, the rights to exploit the lands in America by the Pope. So why, and, and in that case, then they realized that it was very dangerous for the newborn republics and for trade to have these pirates going all over and taking, creating a city like Port Royal. So there was a negotiation, a negotiation between the established crowns and the pirates. And the, the, the leaders of Marquis were, were suspended and these people got some rights uh, and, and so forth and so on. And, why don't we understand that we have to do the same thing with the gangs? Those gangs need to be taken as a very important uh, player in stabilizing the situation in Haiti. And why aren't they in, in any negotiation? Let's let them answer. Or it was to you. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. no, I mean, <laughs> All right. so just in terms of the the piece you talked about, why don't we understand that nation building does not work in the global south? I would argue that uh, empowerment of uh, people in their own countries through democratic processes is something that does and can work. I think that. Uh, the challenge that Haiti has faced is uh, an electoral process and then a, de a democracy that uh, has been unresponsive to uh, the needs of the ordinary Haitian populace and um, helping get the country back on a path towards elections so that they can choose their own leaders and by popular vote rather than um, a decision by either a small group of people or um, by the international community is a better way forward for any country. I certainly would not want someone else to choose the leaders uh, of my country. So I think that process towards elections is vital. But the structures around governance need to exist. It's hard for people to respond to their enlightened self-interest if they lack food, they lack shelter, they lack security. Um, so uh, those things also need to go along with a democratic process. Uh, with regard to negotiating with gangs, I think that uh, having a broad, inclusive dialogue among all segments of society is certainly something uh, that is worth doing. The, the challenge that uh, one faces is that the, the interests of gangs specifically cannot be put ahead of uh, ordinary law-abiding citizens uh, in the country. But there does 
need to be a solution to the problems that create gang members. The, the teenagers and 20-something-year-olds who are in gangs today are not the same ones that were running around in the gangs in 2004 and five when there was also a lot of gang activity. So you have to ask yourself, what is it, what's happening that continues to generate um, year after year of people joining these gangs? Um, so as Monique said, there has to be um, you know, access to education and job opportunities and training programs for people. Those are all very important parts of a solution. I'll stop there in the interest of time. Uh, do uh, either of you want to, because there it has been suggested by some that the gang should have a, a place at the table. So do either of you want to want to respond to this well, back and forth? Well, to the extent that the political and business elite created these gangs, uh, they need to uh, have a, I do agree with that, because we talked about the situation where Ayalami cannot return to the country, but Wantana and the other uh, groups couldn't stop that. The gangs were able to do what she was talking about. She wanted him to resign, and he would have none of it. But now the gangs are, and rightly saying, so we were responsible for this. So now you can form your government, but we, we, we want to have a say-so in the matter. And really, part of the problem we're not talking about it is that I think the political class in Haiti is like zero sum. And, and, and every crossroad that we've gotten to it's either my way or no way, and they have the ability to halt a process. Uh, negotiations are not done in good faith, and, and, and they, they, they just want to have things their way, and no matter what side. And there's a little bit of self-righteousness in the process that I think needs to be tempered, and, and, and think about the country, not myself and my political party, because at this point, that hasn't worked. We've seen it. Uh, and I think we said, U.S., stay out, but we need you. Well, the two cannot exist. It has to be a, a common understanding what our role as Haitians and what the U.S. can do. I think, personally, the U.S. should play a supporting role, not the central role. By that, I mean you have about 1.5 million Americans of Haitian ancestry living in the United States all the brain power that Monique said uh, necessary to do the work is not in Haiti right now. Hasn't been for quite some time. One third of all black doctors in New York State are Haitian. Okay? And then we're talking about a place that cannot provide basic health care. So we have to address that. So what mechanism exists can, can be constructed to allow the collaboration between Monique and I. Because right now we're not on the same page. We're not even talking to each other. Uh, in terms of what's best for Haiti. No one is consulting the diaspora. Which, by the way, Brian, that's the largest donor in Haiti, $4 billion. The U.S. provides, the international community provides one point something billion dollars. Haiti's budget this year is $2.5 billion. So the largest donor is not at the table, right? And the skill set, people with either uh, visceral ties or whatever, mm -hmm. Yesterday, the White House put together a call uh, with the Haitian diaspora. I mean, it went viral the, the, because people were so uh, uh, willing to uh, uh, contribute. You know, we Americans, you know, we went to school here. You have to give back. That's what we've told. And we want to give back to the place where we were born that, you know, we, we care deeply about and very passionate, but they're not at the table. Uh, Brian knows very well there's a program that the State Department had, and then the last guy kind of like did away with it, which was the Haitian American police officers working alongside with the, the counterpart in Haiti, building their capacity. That program was dismantled. I know you were trying to restore it. I don't know where it is now, but there's a police, there's a journalism, media, there's all the institutions that you need to have a, a, a functioning society. They are weak in Haiti, and we need to start there strengthening these institutions. Because everything we're talking about, if you don't have these infrastructures and institutions to underpin it, they won't work. They will fall apart. And we've never tried the, this route before. We're really, in good faith, helping Haitian Americans, Haitian Canadians uh, and French, and so on and so forth, wherever Haitians may be, to play a role in their country. That way, 
we have a stake. And I'm an American citizen. Many of us are. And so what better situation to be able to contribute? And Asians in Haiti used to say, well, you left. Well, right now, everybody has left. You have the exile group, which I call the, those who have left recently because they, they couldn't live in Haiti. And you have the established diaspora. There needs to come a moment where we come together and where we can petition our government to help our homeland get where it needs to be. I agree with you. I don't think you need Kenyans or anybody else. You need help, of, of course. But you should explore further the, the relationship with the Haitian American police officers to come to a better place. Monique, you wanted to say something very quickly? Well, maybe more questions. Oh, great. I'll, okay. I'll intervene after. <laughs> um, OK, right here. Hi, Tom Nagorski. I want to come back to the issue of a force, uh, not so much whether they're Kenyan or any place else. Uh, I think, Mr. Nichols, you mentioned a poll, which I hadn't heard, of support within Haiti for it. But if I could ask uh, uh, Monique and Gary a question about the disposition, to the extent you know it, of the Haitian people to outside force generally. And I, I think it's not an exaggeration to say, on the one hand, the country has, as you have said, the worst the biggest need for such a force that probably any country in the world has. But I can't imagine there's another country with a more fraught history, not just recently UN and everyone else, but going back as you began, Gary, hundreds of years. W what do we know about the willingness and the, and the wishes of the Haitian people to have anybody come and do this work right now? Maybe I could respond to some of that. Uh, I don't trust the polls that had happened. Some of them were paid for by uh, organizations that we don't know. So to me, the, the polling really doesn't mean anything. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, the second thing is that we had uh, an occupation by the United States that lasted 19 years. Haitians, a lot of Haitians died fighting against that. So that, that tells us something about how Haitians feel about that. Now, granted, the situation <laughs> that we are living in is so desperate, and people are feeling a lot of despair. So pretty much a lot of help that is coming, you're going to take it as it comes. But the point I want to make is the following. There is a huge difference between us Haitians saying these are the problems that we have, these are some of the issues, these are areas in which we need help, policy, logistics, et cetera. This was never done by the mafia state government. It was never done. Instead of that, the prime minister sent his foreign minister to the UN to say, we need support. And then everybody is like, OK, support. And then the Kenyans, and then the millions, et cetera. So nowhere along the line was there a Haitian thing that was, this is the security plan. And the point I'm making is the Canadian ambassador to the UN who came to Haiti said, I'm asking government, where is the plan? There is no security plan. So there was nothing that was done. Whatever plan that was done was concocted elsewhere. And then there were meetings in the State Department with the Kenyans, the Kenyans are coming, et cetera. What we are saying is the following. We need support, yes, and we can have it both ways. I don't see a problem with saying we are an independent country, we are a sovereign country. We want to be able to decide what are the needs with our partners, with our partners, not with our handlers. And I think it makes a huge difference when you have your paying a thousand uh, Kenyans to come across the continent to Haiti rather than saying, what are the issues, what are the needs, what are the plans, et cetera, and then who is best uh, who can provide the needs that we have? I don't know that the Kenyans are the ones. No. So I just want to kind of change that around 
to it's not an invasion force that we need. We need to decide, okay, here, are this, here is the situation. What are the needs? This is what is done everywhere. Everywhere. You're not going to send a thousand Kenyans to Israel. You're not going to send a thousand Kenyans to uh, Ukraine. Why send them to us? No. I think we are to sit down. There are people in Haiti, contrary to what Monsieur Pierre Pierre says, there are Haitians who are capable, who are still in Haiti. I was in Haiti until last Monday. I believe I'm capable. Well, all the friends I have, <laughs> all the people I know, they are working in Haiti. No, but wait a minute. You know, the not Haiti enough. is not only a question of gangs. Not there may be 3,000 gang members. We are 11.5 million. So excuse me, let's look at it another way. Let's change the way we look at Haiti. There are people who perhaps do not want to be involved. Yes, I understand the diaspora has a lot of Haitians who can contribute, who are contributing, who are participating, even in the negotiations as we speak. Every day there are meetings with the diaspora, along with the people who are working in the, uh, in the presidential commission. Every day the diaspora is participating. Well, if you have such capable people, how did we get here? Of course, you could always Ask blame. Ask Mr. We can, Nichols. We could always, um, you know. He, uh, Ask Mr. But, Nichols. But, but the we, support we, of the U.S., the support of France, the support of the U.N., I assume we have huge responsibility in what is going on. Of course we are responsible, because the mafia people we have are ours. But I do not, I will not accept anyone to come and tell me that there are no good Haitians, there are no capable Haitians in Haiti. You, I'm sorry. You don't have enough to rebuild this country, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the diaspora that you're talking about, it's a sort of, again, a cabal, a group who has taken over because we won't go there, but it's not really representative of the diaspora writ large. And to think that the people who got us here are the ones who said they're going to solve it is kind of fanciful. And, 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 and it shows you why this crisis is continuing, because the attitude is that we can do it. But you've had, you can blame Brian or whoever you want, but you call yourself a sovereign state that you're highly educated. I, I, I get that, and I'm not challenging that. But it's just simply not enough of you to get done what needs to be done. I think in my, cha my, my task to the diaspora is stop sending money back to Haiti. You're wasting that money. That's a government job to provide basic human rights, okay? Not us. Let's stop it. Let's look for an investment fund and how we can invest in Haiti. The system is no better than what we criticize the missionaries for doing and some of the aid work of doing. And we just become another player in that field, and that's just really wasting $4 billion. And so we got to get smarter, not the same old, same old. You know, people who got us there, you know, we need to find an alternative. It's because we can blame the State Department, the White House, the Pentagon. Yes, but we are responsible as well. And we have to own that. We have to be intellectually honest with ourselves and look in the mirror that we were part of the problem, that zero-sum policy that we have. Okay, go back to 1991. Jean-Bertrand Aristide is ousted. Why did it take 20,000 U.S. soldiers to come back? The Haitians should have solved that problem. We didn't. And... I've watched this very intensely, intensely, excuse me, what has happened in the place of my birth. It is time that we start taking some responsibility as well, and not just like dump it on everybody else as it's their fault. Yes, they are responsible. We need to change the narrative. What can we do? Not continue with the same old conversations. Let's see some action. When you talk about the government didn't have a plan, but there were political actors in the, on the ground on the scene. So where were your plans? Did, did Brian reject them? Did he add sausage, uh, ketchup on them? Where are they? I'd like to see them. I've spent 30 years of my prof professional career from the Sun Sentinel to the New York Times to the Haitian Times writing about Haiti. It's the same story. I predicted we would be there. 
because they are doing the same thing, thinking it's going to be a different result. That's insanity. We need to stop the insanity. Haitian Americans, Haitian uh, in Haiti, they need to be a come to Jesus moment and then stop the nonsense. I am embarrassed. And I'm, I, I told someone I'm tired of explaining maladies because it's unexplainable. I know what happened in 1804. It is big. But at this juncture, you know, we need to stop, just like Vietnam did. My son lives in Vietnam. I, I had the pleasure of visiting Vietnam twice. This is a country that I went to, China, France, exploitation, and U.S. bombing the bejesus out of the place. The new generation said, listen, we're not scarred by this war. We were not alive. We need to move forward. This is what Haiti needs, not some platitude talking about, talking, talking, talking. We need action. We need to recruit people with the knowledge. I did not say there was nobody in Haiti capable, uncapable. There are, but it's not enough to move a country around, and we need to recognize that. If you want the Americans' help, look towards the Haitian Americans. It pains me deeply to have to say we have to cut this conversation short. We've got at least two hours left in this. Because, I mean, <laughs> I've been tasked to end the conversation on time. If there's any final thought you had, um, because they just spoke, or should we leave it there? Well, I do have a couple of thoughts. And one, I want to thank all of you on the panel for um, helping shine a spotlight on this incredibly important issue. Um, the challenges that the Haitian people face, and as we in the international community have an obligation to help Haitians uh, to find a better future. The United States has stepped forward to do that. Um, we work on this issue tirelessly. Uh, there has been engagement from the level of the president on down, um, focused on trying to find a way forward. And that way forward, I will repeat, means we have to provide uh, support to Haitians uh, to rebuild their democracy. We have to give Haitians the security they need to rebuild their lives. We have to find ways to provide basic services in conjunction with the Haitian government for its people. The role of the diaspora uh, is a vital role. Uh, the amount of talent that is demonstrated in the Haitian diaspora, whether it's in uh, Miami or New York or Montreal or Quebec or Paris, um, demonstrates that the problems in Haiti are a software issue. It's not a hardware issue. Right. Haitians are incredibly talented and capable, but we have to give them the things that they need to succeed uh, and rebuild uh, a country that has uh, a unique and important place uh, in the history of our region and in our world. Uh, and we're going to work tirelessly toward that end. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, Gary, and Monique, for, for participating in this important conversation. And thank you to all of you who joined us. Um, please note that video and a transcript of this conversation will be on CFR's website. Thank you very much. Thank you.